Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this Sunday, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to to be preaching this morning as Pastor Darren and his wife are on vacation, and I've uh, been praying for their for their time and look forward to them coming back. Um, speaking of coming back, he'll be preaching next Sunday, and that's 4th of July. And so we invite you to be a part of this celebration as we honor those who have and who are serving in the military during our first service and second service. Um, first service at 9 a.m. will be indoors, and then the second service will be outside at 1030. And after the 1030 service, we'll have a barbecue and all the fixings. And um, there'll be games set up for, um, for us to play with, uh, volley square and volleyball. Uh, cornhole and different things to do as individuals and as a church and a family. So we really invite you to to come and be a part of that and invite friends as well. VBS is happening um, right after that Sunday, July 5th to the 9th, with a superhero theme. So if you know any kids, the ages is pre-K through 5th grade that would like to be a part of that, please invite them, get them information or pass that information on to Pastor Janine. She would really appreciate it. And I know there's still room to help, so if you have time during 9 to noon, July 5th to the 9th, um, she would love to hear from you to get a hold of Pastor Janine for that. And then we just want to thank you for your continued faithfulness in giving. We, we truly appreciate it, and the blessings to the community as a church we can be because of that is, um, is great. It's really good. So thank you for your continued discipline of, um, of giving. Well, let's dive into today's passage. We've been going through Jeremiah, the, the one known as the weeping prophet, uh, partly for the hard truths he had to say, and partly was his um, isolation and not a lot of friendships. And he had preached, prophesied for 40 years with uh, not a lot of return on those words. And, um, but yet throughout the book of Jeremiah, we've seen um, the people of Israel hurting and struggling. And, and you see God who is full of hope and restoration and promises and his presence. And it's like God is continually chasing them, reminding them. And though the Israelites will sometimes come back to that, they sometimes will fade away from that. And yet God never gives up. The sermon topics we had Pastor Janine begin with um, trust issues in Jeremiah. And her key statement was, what areas of your life do you need to trust God with today? What areas of your life do you need to trust Him today? Pastor Darren spoke last week of the plans God has for each person, plans to prosper, plans for a future. And he did a great job of reminding us that the word prosper does not mean an easy path, but more like a root underground that keeps growing through the dirt and persevering. And many times we hear he has a plan and a future for us not to harm us. And we think it'll be easy that he'll move the dirt so we can just go right through. But it was a great remembering and and knowing in the Hebrew that what it meant is you're like a root that needs to continually to grow regardless of the dirt and to keep going. And it was a great Father's Day message. Well, like I said before, we wrap up our time in Jeremiah, and we'll be in Jeremiah 31 if you'd like to turn there. And we'll find in our passage today God's great love for his people. It really is a love story. And through doom and gloom, as we've read and and studied throughout Jeremiah, God's love continues to be about this book. And I'm excited to share with you verses and things that I've learned that have been important in my life and I believe important in the life of the church. So as you turn to Jeremiah 31, it starts in verse 1. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survived the sword will find favor in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past or far away, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again, and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your timbrels, and you will go out and dance with the joyful. 
Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion for the Lord, to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says, Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. This passage is about God calling Israel to himself, to community, to grace, to hope and love through his, God's faithfulness, through his love, not ours. The covenant that he speaks about and, and he, he gets to later on in Jeremiah 31 is based upon his ability to hold on to the covenant and make it true. Throughout the passage we read, verses 1 through 7, there is a changing from grief to joy, brokenness to being built up. Verse 2, we read, this is what the Lord says, The people who survive the sword will find favor in the wilderness. I will come and give them rest. And there were people that were literally in the wilderness, still wandering, still exiled. And it says the Lord wouldn't wait till the promised land to be with them. He would go and find them. True today, too, as sometimes we find ourselves in the wilderness, and maybe that brings about images of lost or wandering or trying to be lost, wandering on purpose, and yet God continues to show up there. In the confusion or the hurt, the anger, the distance, God is still there. It's a love story. It's a, it's a love that chases us. I like how it says in verse 6, Uh, there will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion for the Lord our God. There will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, Come, let us go to Zion to the Lord our God. And watchmen were the ones that watched out for danger on the towers. And in Scripture, they were to look out for the sheep and to make sure the people were taken care of. And a lot of times these watchmen saw danger and spoke about danger. But here it says, look, the watchmen will say, let's go see our God. It'll be a time of joy and hope. And then in verse 7 is particularly important. And I want to jump off verse 7 into the rest of Jeremiah and what we're doing today. You see these four imperatives, this critical, critical crucial things happen here in verse 7 that we need to pay attention to. Verse 7, this is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Because God is calling all of Israel to him, back to community, to grace, hope and love through his faithfulness, there's reason to celebrate. This is the reason they can shout for joy. One commentary puts it this way. This text speaks about God's grace, love, and covenant faithfulness that he extends to those who have walked away from their relationship with him. They can hear in the text the gospel, the good news of the possibility of experiencing God's grace, love, and faithfulness in their desperate and hopeless existence. Three times repeated again in this text is certainly good news. For those who not, not, do not see any hope for salvation, then or now. And it is easy for us to accept grace, love, and faithfulness as God's way of relating to those who remain faithful to him. Well, I've been faithful and I've wandered, so certainly he'll call me back. But it poses a question here about Jeremiah that we, we find in the New Testament scriptures as well as our world today. It goes on. What about those who have broken their relationship with him and live in alienation from him? What about those who have refused to recognize and accept God's grace in their lives? Do they deserve God's continued gracious overtures towards them? The good news in the text is that God comes into the wilderness of our human existence with the announcement of his grace, everlasting love, and covenant faithfulness. 
the text reminds us that there are, these are God's enduring attributes, and thus a source of hope for all, sinners and saints alike. The text is a classic expression of the dynamic optimism of grace and the possibility of sinners to experience the joy of salvation and to sing the song of the redeemed. The text reminds us that God in his grace, love, and faithfulness is the real builder of lives of those who live a shattered shattered and broken life. Amen. This is the story of Jeremiah 31. It is a love story. And people hear it and they say, well, I've wandered. I'm too far, too deep in the wilderness. And God says, no, no, you're not. No, you're not. Let's go. So how is God going to do this? He says these words, but we need to know how. Is this true? Is it going to happen? Staying in chapter 31, we go to verse 31. and We begin to see how God is going to do this. Verse 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. They broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The the promise of this passage to the hearers and readers at that time was a promise of new ways of doing things. The old wasn't working. And maybe you experienced that in life, that the, the, the old ways of thinking and doing just aren't capturing new things in your life, physically, mentally, emotionally, even spiritually. This promise is a way... A promise, an invitation to a closer and deeper relationship between God and them that is available, that brings about forgiveness of sins and a hope for their life. No wonder it's a reason to shout, to scream, to praise his name and proclaim his goodness. You see, we read today Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 through a different lens. For those that read this and saw this for the first time, they hung on this and said, yes, we want a new way. We want our our forgiveness of our sins and to be remembered no more. And yet there was still a waiting for them. You and I, we view this through the lens of Jesus and the imparting of the Holy Spirit that we find in Acts. We are part of the new covenant. We get to see this in action. The New Testament makes it very, very clear that all the details of this new covenant spoken in Jeremiah find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Luke 20, 20 talks about the new covenant. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The forgiveness of sins, the new covenant. It talks about relationship with God, with the law and mind on heart, uh, with law on our, on our mind and heart, is Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The Spirit governs by law, and that law is love and freedom. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit In the spirit, have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. 
Jeremiah talks about how we will no longer have to teach neighbors no God because the Spirit's within us and it testifies to God himself and it testifies to us we are children. The intimate fellowship that Jeremiah promises is found in John 14, 21 and verse 23 and verse 26. Jesus says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. It goes on, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. He will go after them, this intimacy, he will chase us for it. And then Jesus says, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. It will be written on your mind and your heart, and the Spirit will remind you from within. And this is all possible because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for you and I. It wasn't at the Last Supper that the, the covenant, the new covenant, was enacted. It was announced. But it was on the cross and the empty tomb that it became a reality. And that's the lens we can view this through. Hebrews 10, verse 11 through 18. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Day after day, year after year, people would bring their guilt, their sin their shame offering. And he would go to the temple and do it, and your sins are forgiven. You are cleansed, but they walked away knowing, still knowing they weren't. It became a ritual, and it just became an exercise. And God saw that it wasn't working. It worked on the way that God prepared it to work in the tabernacle and people being obedient to the temple. But as far as their minds and their hearts, it wasn't cleansing. It wasn't renewing. There had to be a new way. But when this, it continues on, but when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Hebrews goes on to say Jesus doesn't continually sacrifice himself on the cross every time we sin. He has sacrificed once and for all, for all sin. And it's the invitation, it's the gateway, it's the ability for us to enter into the Holy of Holies, it says. Seek permission to speak with the Father and say, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. It goes on. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them at that time. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. Sounds familiar. And this is what Hebrews is connecting with. Jesus is the new covenant. And he adds, the sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And this is the reason why you and I can shout with joy, scream for joy, praise God and proclaim his name. And because it, it says this, and where there has been forgiveness... Sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. That's great news. It's God's love story. Found in Jeremiah, the promise, and filled in the New Testament. And here we are living in it. Well, there's one final tie-in from our passage from Jeremiah to the New Testament. And just as in Jeremiah I talked about, this was for everyone. Even those who have broken off relationship with God, the undeserved, the unwanted, the no good, the, the same promise of salvation and hope and grace and joy and a full life is for everyone. To those we would maybe exclude, it is for everyone. Even in the New Testament, they struggled with this. In John chapter 15, verse 1, now the tax collectors and sinners we're all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them? 
And here they are casting their dispersions on the no good people, the evil people, the one that have no right in the family of God have no permission to sit in the tabernacle of the church next to me, to study and love the same God that I love. Who is this guy? And he claims to be the Savior, doesn't he know? But yet you see in Jeremiah, yes, he is. He is the Savior because all are welcome. Verse 8 says, suppose a woman has ten silver coins, loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. It is open for all. That's what the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son says. There is nothing you can do that makes you too far away from God's grace. That excludes you from salvation. He's drawing to you. His love chases you. Be caught. Be found by God. And let this be a reminder that the far-reaching compassion of God does not exclude anyone. It is extended to the brokenhearted and those who live without hope. we got to remember that God's goal is not to create an exclusive community of the strong and powerful believers who would be his special mediators of his blessing to the world. It's not how he designed the church for us to be the biggest and the best, and then we will disperse the blessing to the Lord. The blessings of God will come through all of God's restored people the weak, the helpless, people like me. It will be an inclusive community in which all are welcome regardless of anything. You are welcome here. The promise of grace, hope, forgiveness, salvation is for everyone. And I wrote here, and it's it's emboldened, even me, a sinner, Who am I that the Lord would know my name? Even me, a sinner, is invited by grace to a fellowship, relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So here's my challenge, my ending remarks. If you've broken off God from areas of your life, maybe some areas are slipping through the fingers of your trust, or maybe your hope in Christ is fading. You're completely on your own. You've never said yes to Jesus. You've either actively said no or just, just, just never made a decision, thought about it. You're just not there. You are not too far gone. First Peter 2, 9 through 10 is this beautiful promise. But you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but you have received mercy. This is the truth. This is the truth that has entered our hearts and minds as a believer in Christ, and it can be your truth today. It can be a truth that's brand new or restored to you. And this truth will cause you to be more human. As God created us to be joyful, hopeful, full of mercy, full of courage, so full of life and purpose that we don't survive this life, but we live life to the fullest. And this is the reason to shout with joy. This is a reason to scream for joy, praise his name and proclaim the goodness of God. It's an invitation for all, because all are welcome to salvation, to God's grace and goodness. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those that see this and hear this would know you. Those that that see this and haven't taken the time to consider what a relationship with you looks like, they will do that. They will find someone, whether it be in this church or elsewhere. um, They reach out say, what does a relationship with Jesus look like? 
What, what do I do? And that they would find your grace, your love. And may they see the traces of your grace and love throughout the life chasing them. Pray for those that have broken off areas of our life from you. Broken out of community with one another in the faith or out of the uh, community of you. Who are maybe in the wilderness because we're confused and angry. And we don't know what a close relationship looks like, but... But it, it, it didn't help during those times. So maybe we're trying a different route. Would you call us back into relationship, to deeper relationship with you? And Father, as a church, may we welcome all. May they all be welcome to experience the grace and the joy and the mercy, salvation that is theirs through Jesus Christ. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.